Hey, it's Mike Hambright with Flipner.com. Welcome back for another exciting VIP interview where I interview successful real estate investing experts and entrepreneurs in our industry to help you learn and grow. Today, I'm joined by Steve Bighouse, who's recognized nationally as an expert in the mortgage industry, specifically around financing to investors. Now, as you probably know, there's a lot of misinformation about how to finance your rental properties and how to get started uh, and even how to grow, um, especially as you're uh, trying to grow your portfolio or get started. So. Um, building a rental portfolio is a very powerful way to build long-term wealth and cash flow and financing obviously is a key to that. So today Steve is going to share a ton of his great knowledge of how to finance investors, how they work with investors, and how you can either get started or you can build your portfolio from here. Before we get started though, let's take a moment to recognize our featured sponsors. RealtyMogul.com is an online marketplace for real estate investing, connecting borrowers and capital from accredited and institutional investors. Get a rehab loan fast and close in as little as 10 days. Rates start as low as 9%. We'd also like to thank National Real Estate Insurance Group, the nation's leading provider of insurance to the residential real estate investor market. From individual properties to large-scale investors, National Real Estate Insurance Group is ready to serve you. Please note, the views and opinions expressed by the individuals in this program do not necessarily reflect those of Flipnerd.com or any of its partners, advertisers, or affiliates. Please consult professionals before making any investment or tax decisions, as real estate investing can be risky. Hey, Steve. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, yeah. Glad you're here. So it's, it's interesting. We were talking beforehand, uh, you know, people that listen to the show that have listened to quite a few episodes probably pick up on this, but I usually uh, talk with, you know, the guest beforehand and we talk about what we're going to talk about. And, um, you know, after doing a, over 170 shows, one of my challenges always is how do we keep it fresh? How do we find something we haven't talked about? And uh, while we, ha it's not that we've never talked about financing before, but uh, I think this is a little different today um, in terms of how to finance your rental properties especially it's one thing if you have a hundred rental properties and you're looking to refinance or you're looking to do uh, things with some of the big guys, but there's a lot of people that, you know, just never get started or there's so much misinformation that they have a deal or they have access to a deal, but they're, they're just get hung up on the money part of it. Sure. And so I'm glad you're going to share some of your insights and experiences with us today. Now well, I'll do my best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, Hey, but before we get started, uh, Steve, why don't you tell us, about uh, yourself and, and how you uh, got in your position now and a little bit about uh, Team Big House. Okay. Well, let's see. Uh, um, it, my adventure started in 85 when I got out of the service. Um, spent eight years in the Air Force, decided, you know, knew that I didn't want to be a cop on the outside. And so I uh, kind of wanted to get into the finance and I've always been pretty good with numbers. And I uh, talked with a gentleman the local um, in Longview where I grew up. He suggested that I go sell real estate for a couple of years. So I did that up until 88, and then he offered me a position in that with financing, and I just started from there. So I moved, was there a couple of years, moved into the banking uh, uh, banking world, uh, eventually worked my way up to be a vice president of the bank, running a mortgage department here in Seattle. Okay. Started with, working with a group of investors that were buying at the foreclosure auctions. and. You know, over the years, and that they bought like two or three hundred properties. Made a decision to start a company here in the area to help people. You know, pass that information on to buy at the auctions. Um, did that with with them for probably about five or six, seven years. Uh, was contacted in 2008 by a gentleman in Memphis. Actually, it was uh, actually it would have been the latter part of 2007 uh, about you know financing in Memphis. Uh, the only thing I knew about Memphis at that point in time was blues barbecues, and that, that was about it. <laughs> and so I did some research uh, through the month of December, and that looked in, looked intriguing, you know, as far as who the players was, the model, talked to a couple of folks, hopped on an airplane in January, uh, went out there, flew out to Memphis for about a week, kind of getting the lay of the land. I did that for about five months because the model was totally different than anything I was, I, I was accustomed to. Right. Uh, wrote my first loan in I think it was June, June of 2008, and been ever since. And that, so the model worked well. Once we started to develop that reputation in Memphis, we've expanded. Currently, right now, we're in 18 states. Awesome. And, and finance and investors. I have a, myself as the only loan officer on the team, and then I've got six people as far as support staff that help me uh, 
finance and real estate investors. Okay. Why don't you share kind of at a high level how lenders um, or underwriters, uh, especially if you're with, with a larger bank, how they look at uh, owner occupants versus tenants. Because a lot of a lot of us, you know, that have been in the business for a long time, you know, like for example, uh, I have private money. I have some smaller local banks that finance my stuff, and but I do my we do our operations checking uh, accounts at Chase, sure. and it's because you know I drive past four of them on the way to work, and it's just easy. In fact, they're very good for uh, that type of stuff. Have lots of great apps and stuff like that. But there's a lot of turnover inside of a Chase. You know, it's pretty much like a retail store. Every time I go in, there's a new banker that wants to talk to me about how they can help finance some of my business. And I say, let's not waste our time here because you don't get me. And we're just going to have a conversation. And in 15 minutes, you're going to say, no, we can't do that. Because that's what happens every time. Um, and uh, it's interesting, you know, this happened the last time it happened, maybe a year ago. It was a senior loan guy. We finally. I caved and I said, let's just sit down and I'll tell you what we do. And he said, no, we can't, we can't do that. It's too risky. And I yeah. said, look, I have a bunch of rental properties that I have at about 50% loan to value and you guys will finance people at 97% all day long um, that effectively have no equity in their house. And you're telling me that I'm risky? It's just, it's just counterintuitive, right? You know, it's, it's amazing that when you hear that, when you talk about the investors as far as risk. Yeah. And that's the way a lot of institutions look at investment properties. They feel that they're a riskier type of law. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's unfortunate because I don't feel it that way. I mean, at least I don't see it in our experience. I mean, we're a direct lender to Fannie Mae, um, and I've worked with several institutions that loan directly to Fannie and always get input as to far as uh, how servicing is performing. And the feedback that we have after the audits are that the investment portfolio is probably the best performing part of our portfolio. <laughs> right. Now, I think a lot of people, what they do is they go back and look at risk. They look at what happened during the mid-2000s because it was a combination of owner-occupied and there were a lot of investors out there. I mean, you could do, you could buy a property at the auction, you paid 200000 for it, it was worth four. They were telling people to get these option arms, you know, get them, you know, pull the money back out. That was, you know, that was adding to the risk, and a lot of people still haven't gotten over that yet. Right. But uh, what I see the uh, you know the investors today is I see a different type of investors. I see somebody that's really looking at not necessarily appreciation, uh, you know, making that money on a flip, even though that there is some it, there is some uh, uh, validity to flipping property. But what I've seen the market really change for is cash flow. Yeah. And so you get these people that come in, they recognize that that. It's long-term cash flow. You know, this is how they're going to create their wealth and that, or their retirement, you know, however that they want to look at it, how they can control it. So I look at the investors that are coming in today, you know, they've got, you know, they've got income, they've got, you know, pretty decent jobs. They've got some cash, uh, cash in the bank. They've got decent credit. These are the people that are coming in, both entry level and seasoned investors that are trying to get farther. And then with Fannie Mae, we can do up to 10 finance properties. Um, I've got some cases, you know, where, where you get to, you know, the individual can do 10 properties. And then now husband and wife, they both have jobs. They both got credit. They both got assets. They can literally double those figures to where they can go to, you know, they can go to 20. Hmm. Okay. And, or, or if they're domestic partners. So we help them get the, you know, get that way there. And then I've developed over the years and have developed uh, contacts for people that want to move past that 10, where, because at that point in time, they're really a commercial borrower. Right. You know, some people that, that, you know, if you want to continue past that 10, here's some people that you need to connect with that can possibly help you with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe you could uh, start by telling us, you know, a lot of folks that use uh, financing for, let's say they're getting started and they want to buy some rental properties. They typically you know, may potentially have the opportunity to use the GSEs, use, to use Fanny type money. So tell us this, uh, break down some myths in terms of whether you can buy four properties or 10 or uh, depending on who you talk to, they might be able to get 10 done and some can't. Okay. So, so that's fine at that. The, uh, you've got the two major GSEs, you've got Fanny and Freddie. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Freddie is limited to four. They never, they never changed years back. They used to be a 10. Uh, never made that decision to change back to the 10 they've always kept it at four. Um, so 
Fannie Mae is actually pretty investor friendly. I mean, they, they really are. So they've got 10 finance properties. Um, when you go to some of the larger institutions or just institutions as a whole, they'll tell you they're capped at four. Those are lender overlays. So in other words, the lender makes the decision to restrict the growth of the investor. Okay. So they'll do that. So the other, some of the other things that you see is maybe they'll, uh, they'll slow down as to far as how many investment properties you can buy in a given year. Maybe they'll cap you at two which is a, uh, they don't like to use the term rapid acquisition, rapid acquisition because they feel that that's risky. So they'll limit that. That's not a, you know, it's not a Fannie Mae policy. Um, and so why would a lender do that? Is it, is it because they fear that they can't, they can't then in turn sell that? Well, not necessarily that they can't sell it. They don't want to take the risk. They feel in their, in their opinion, the investment, the investor is a riskier type of person to lend to. So they don't want to, in their terms, maybe overexpose themselves. Okay. So for that lender, though, if, if Fannie is backing it, what is their risk? What's their exposure to something going wrong? Well, you know, it, there's always a risk anytime you do a loan where, you know, two, a couple years down the line, the people, you know, the person, individual may default on the loan. They'll go back and they'll take a look at it. Um, bottom line is, that they're just not comfortable with the investment property. So instead of trying to help investors, they actually set it up to discourage people or make it more difficult right. to obtain financing. Yeah. Um, and maybe you could dispel some of the myths around. So this is something that early on that I discovered. Because when, when I got into real estate investing, to be frank, my, my wife and I went in with both feet. We left our jobs. And so at that point, we were um, on em our self-employed people with less than two years tax returns. So we couldn't get Fannie or Freddie loans. By the time that we had uh, two years tax returns, we were uh, we had more than ten properties, okay. and in fact, they they were through private lenders and stuff to where uh, there was no uh, they were financed in a different way. Some of them were actually owned outright. But what kind of surprised me is that um, even if we had owned ten of them and paid cash for them, that that kind of counts towards our limit of ten properties, right? Yeah. If the properties are owned free and clear, they don't count. The, the, the magic term is financed. Mm. So with Fannie Mae, they're looking at, at financed properties. Now, one of the myths that I do hear is people will come to me and say, well, they don't show on my credit report. And I said, that, okay, so that's fine. But I can pick them up on your tax returns. Yeah, I'll see that you pay financing. So there isn't a distinction that, that Fannie Mae makes that says that the financing is only for credit that shows on your credit report. It's financed properties as a whole. So whether it's it's an institutional lender, whether it's private financing, it's considered a financed property. Okay. So when you own a property free and clear, it's not financed. I see. And so granted, now, now granted, you can take credit for the income, any expenses that you have on the property, but as long as there's no financing, it it you know doesn't count. Yeah, yeah. So you know one of the challenges that we kind of talked about uh, briefly before we started today was that for investors in my world where we buy and sell a lot of houses through wholesalers or we're wholesaling them to other investors, we tend to, for example, when I wholesale houses, I only sell to cash buyers or cash like people that can move very quickly. So it could be hard money. Okay. The challenge is with using um, uh, GSE type money is that it's not that fast. So maybe talk a little bit about uh, that limits some investors from buying properties because they don't understand that bridge to here, I'm going to refinance it through you, for example, um, but I need to do something differently up front. Maybe kind of talk about uh, how that process works or the cleanest way that it should work. Well, you know, I tell people in that, I mean, perfect world in that, the, the process that they're going to do the financing where they're putting 20, 25% down, figure 30 to 45 days on the process. And that's, and that's provided that there's no issues on title. Uh, you know, we can get the appraiser into the property. If there's rehab on the property, everything moves along good. So, so the process itself really isn't that bad. Um, I would say probably about 25% of my business right now are investors that pay cash for a property. So in other words, and that's like anything, they always feel that if they offer a cash deal, they can close in a week, week and a half. They've got a little bit more leverage and maybe, you know, maybe get a little bit better deal when they purchase the property. Yeah. So Fannie, a few years back, came out with what they called the delayed financing exception. Now, prior to that, cash out refinance, you couldn't own more than four finance properties. You had to be on title for six months. That was the rules, okay? When they 
added the delayed financing exception, what that did was that targeted borrowers that had five, six, seven, eight, or nine properties that were probably strong borrowers. These are the guys that had the cash, they had the credit, they had the income. They could do this. And so what they'd do is they'd buy a house for 50. That house was worth 75. Well, what they do in that is they come to me, I, you know, I just purchased this house, paid $50,000 cash. We, on, on our side, now obviously we're going to verify where those funds came from. They can immediately turn around, refinance the property. They've got a six-month window from the date of purchase to get the transaction completed in. I can do up to 70 or 75 percent, depending upon how many financed properties that they have. They can receive up to their original purchase price back, and I can utilize the appraised value to drive them on the value. Okay, so it's based so on appraised based value, not necessarily purchase price. No, it's, it's work, it works off appraised value. Now, some lenders, where we talk about those overlays, some lenders will say, yes, Mike, we do offer that, but we base our loan to value off of the purchase price, right. not the appraised value. Right. So again, that's an additional overlay that the lender puts on the property. I see. Okay. And, uh, and so it, that's interesting because when, what I think I had heard in the past, and again, th we're talking about misinformation here, right? Is that, um, typically you would need to own the property for six months before you can refinance it. Uh, or maybe that was if you wanted to do a cash out. Um, I don't know if that was a, a, an overlay type issue or that was a specific Fannie rule at the time. Or that was, and that rule is still in effect. Okay, so, so if I get a borrower that comes to me that's owned a property for a year, and let's say they owe 50 on it, the house is worth 100, they own four finance properties or less, they want to pull 75 out of it, they can do that. They've been on the property for six months, they own less than four finance properties, and that's still in place. The delayed financing filled a void for those people that paid cash that maybe had more than four finance properties that paid cash wanted to get their money back. Because basically what these people do, they get their 50 grand back, uh, they recycle their money. Now they can go out and buy another house. Right. And so, but typically these are the people that, that are stronger because once you move past that four finance property, credit scores increase. You know, you have to have a minimum 720 credit score. Um, instead of, instead of um, you know, the reserve requirements increase. So now you've got to have six months PITI in reserves on each investment property. Yeah. And so again, you're looking financially, you're looking at a much stronger and, and in time, probably a more sophisticated borrower. Right, right. Um, and talk about uh, a little bit about how, um, you know, some one of the challenges, I'm, I'm giving you challenges here that I know investors face, which is that typically real estate investors are usually told to not put houses in your personal name. You should close in legal entities. So I know that uh, if you're using Fannie or Freddie, they pretty much have to be in your personal name. And I know that people can deed them over to their business after they finance and things like that. But maybe share your experience and kind of the, what the right way to do it is here. Well, you know, both Fannie and Freddie, the GSE, only loan to natural individuals. So if, if the property is in an LLC, you need to quick claim it out. I need to close it in the name of the individual. What they do after, you know, if they transfer it over to an LLC, uh, that's between them, their accountant, you know, the IRS, however they set it up. Right. And we all know why they, they transferred the LLCs. It's for asset protection. Right. Um, you know, there's still a lot of debate about there whether whether there's a due on sale clause. That's probably something they want to take up with their attorney, you know, as far as giving advice. Sure. But I've seen a lot of investors do it. Um, you know, to give you an idea, I mean, when a person comes to me, and they want to purchase a new property, they might have an LLC already set up that's got four loans in it that are set up in the LLC. I still count those loans against them. And the way the underwriting guidelines are, they, could, they are still considered an obligated debt, even though they're in the LLC. Because let's face it, you and I both know, an LLC, all you do is take put a blanket over your head. When I remove the blanket, it's still you. <laughs> yeah. And, and the vehicle to put them in those LLCs is a matter of a quick claim deed or a warranty deed, however they do that. Where they run into problems is if they try to transfer to a corporation. Because at that point in time, whether they've set up an S-Corp or a C-Corp, the only, only vehicle to utilize to be able to transfer, say, from like yourself into a corporation, you have to actually sell the property right. to the corporation. I tell, I tell any of my clients to try and do that. That file ever gets audited at any point in time for whatever reason, whether it's a random audit, maybe you missed a payment, they see that you sold the property or corporation, guarantee it, they're going to call your note due. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so 
maybe you could just kind of tell us at a high level uh, what people should look for in finding a right lender, the right lender, because I know a lot of folks, you know, some of the challenges they have is they work with somebody that doesn't necessarily specialize in, in real estate investors and or the lender has all these overlays. I think a lot of people that buy properties, it's almost like if a, for a lot of folks, if a doctor tells you something, it must be true. But if you had 10 doctors, they may tell you 10 different things. So people just assume, well, that's what my lender and, you know, they're, they're financing. Um, it was a Fannie type product. So therefore, this is how Fannie Mae works. Uh, that's, I know that's a big misconception, but how, how do you find those lenders that can help kind of serve you the best? Well, you know, the way a lot of people come to, come to me and that is through reputation. Um, so they'll talk to other investors. Maybe the wholesalers will recommend over to, you know, recommend them over to us. And so that's typically where that starts. And I think it's really important that when the customer comes to a lender, that they ask them pointed questions. Unfortunately, what happens is that a lot of people that are out in the industry right now that are working as loan officers don't know. It's unfortunate to say, but it's the, it's the absolute truth. Yeah. And God forbid if you go to one of those internet companies where they, you know, they take your application over the phone, you're talking to one of 30 customer service people, they're definitely not going to know. So you need to make the decision. I, you know, I tell people, I said, the difference between driving a Volkswagen or a Rolls Royce, okay? You know, Volkswagen's a cheap car, and you're right. Some of, those, uh, some of the other lenders, they can probably beat me a little bit more on rates and fees. Um, that's fine. You know, that's just, that's just part of the business and the way we operate. And that's, you know, you got to love capitalism because that's what capitalism is. <laughs> right. Uh, but secondly, in that, what I tell people is I says, do you want to look at a lender, one that's going to give you the cheapest rates? Or do you want somebody that's going to help you really map out what you want to do financially? As far as, I mean, do you want to go to seven properties? Do you want to go to 10 properties? Do you want to start with five? Where do you want to be? Because I'm the guy that's going to be able to help you get there. Yeah. So talking to a lender that can provide you with the right information is just absolutely imperative. And if I don't know the answer, what's nice with my company, because they really help, help support my business, is that one, I can go to corporate. And if corporate doesn't know, they can go direct to Fannie Mae. And who better to hear from directly from Fannie Mae? Yeah. Yeah. And so having those resources out there and information, I think, is, is really important. Yeah, and even on the kind of owner occupancy, when we buy and you know rehab or resell houses, you know, every time we sell a house, we don't control who the lender is because the seller or their agent has picked that lender. But my fear every time, every time we're working with somebody is the lender says everything is fine, but it always comes down to the last couple of days when the underwriter starts going through the file. <laughs> And so it's, there's always a challenge with not just lenders, but a lot of spaces is at the end of the day, you have a sales guy saying, we can do this. Uh, this is, there's no problem. But ultimately, the underwriter is going to decide what can or can't be done. And there's nothing worse than thinking you're good to go and coming down to the wire and then hearing that um, can't be done or there's a problem with something that nobody anticipated up until that point, unfortunately. And that goes back to my, my statement I made a couple of minutes ago about the about the loan officer not knowing. It's their job to know. Right. Seriously, that's their job. If they work for a company, they should know what they can do and what they can't do. I mean, I do the same thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm as smart as any underwriter out there. I can argue any underwriter any day of the week. And it, but I take I've taken the time to do the research, and I'm going to do that before I put my client into a house because the last call I want to make is 30 days later. Is oh, it's not going to work. Uh, I failed as a loan officer at that point in time to my client. Yeah, yeah. So I, I often tell a lot of new real estate investors, Steve, that you know if you don't have, if you're just getting started, and you have a good job, take advantage of uh, getting loans through the GSEs because they're better rates, they're long term, they're fixed, right? Sure. And there's a there's a window that's open right now. If you don't take advantage of it, and you get beyond that tenth that tenth property, then it's a whole different world. It's a whole whole different product you're not going to get a 20 or 30 year fixed rate loan from anybody um, and so uh, what kind of advice would you give to people that are maybe just getting started that kind of have that window still open uh, to make sure that they take advantage of it well and I think with anybody and that is one they get it, have to get in the mind the right mindset to be able to do this so they need to talk to people that can help them give them advice as far as actually actually looking at inventory you know, so they're comfortable in a market, whether they, they finance within their home state or they go outside of the state, they start doing their homework there. Um, as far as a lender goes in that, they just need to, you know, search out 
somebody that can help them on the financing because let's face it they might have the cash they might have the job they might have the credit but if they don't have somebody that's going to walk them through that financing it may not become a reality for them right so a lot of people have to get over that initial fear that they can't do it because a lot of times they can't yeah yeah what are some other things you see steve that are kind of you know misinformation that's out there or just bad information that's out there that um, people should kind of avoid or look out for well, you know, I, I comment, you know, one of the uh, the common uh, overlays that I hear is about a two-year two year landlord history experience requirement. So in other words, they've got to have documented two full years of, of owning rentals before they can utilize the income off their new rental property to qualify for it. That's not true. Okay. okay. So that's on a purchase transaction. And I can go as far as like with Fannie Mae, they don't even require a lease. So if the property is vacant at the time, the appraiser provides me his estimation as far as fair market rent. I can utilize seventy-five percent of that figure to offset the payment. Okay. So that's so. So the two-year landlord history experience requirement is an additional overlay that lenders place on it. Um, we've had some where they have geographic restrictions, where if the customer doesn't live within a hundred miles of the subject property, they won't finance it because they don't uh, they don't feel that they can manage the property. Unfortunately. Majority of people right now, all of my clients, I would say probably, geez, 99.9% .9 of my clients, they don't manage their property. They use a property manager. Right. Um, I wouldn't even attempt to manage my own property yeah. because you've got to stay up on laws, you know, all the accounting that goes along with it. I don't have time for that. Yeah. And that's what I hire a property manager for. So again, it's back to that not understanding or not, not not necessarily on the lender's part not necessarily not understanding not wanting to understand it and feel that and it's just easier to say it's risky we don't want to do it right right and what are i know i know rates are all over the board but what are the what are typical rates right now um that you're seeing and then what are the typical terms i mean you're these are typically people that are able to get 30-year fixed loans is that right yeah and the rates i mean you might get into the you might get into the low fives uh maybe the high fours i mean they're just all across the board yeah. right now um i always hate to state specific rates sure because, sure you know but you know they, you know they're there i mean the rates are good right now absolutely even at, even at six percent yeah you know with some of these properties with the price points they're getting into still makes sense still cash flow yeah yeah so maybe you could take a few minutes and talk about when folks get up above 10 and they can't use the gses anymore what uh, the typical products that they that you have available or that they should be looking for to kind of grow from there well there's a, there's another company they just opened up a product uh, this year and which actually allows people to go past that 10 they don't have a limit as far as number of finance properties I'm still anything new I'm always a little apprehensive at first so I'm just letting some of the other other lenders that I know try the product out see how it works because uh, if a product when it when it's being new in that there's going to be a lot of a uh, lot of learning curves right. until they get to get that up um, i tell the clients that once you get past 10 um the gses look at you like fanny and freddie they look at you more like a commercial right you know commercial individual so maybe that's exploring commercial possibilities with banks which some of my clients have done yeah yeah great well steve if uh, folks want to learn more about um your business and i know you have a lot of information on your website dispelling a lot of the myths we've talked about today and, and much more uh why don't you tell us where where they should go well they can get started my website at teambighouse.com uh spell the last name b-i-g-h-a-u-s so they can start there uh, all of my contact information is on our website they can look at some of the uh, the videos that we've done we're in the process of redoing some of them um and and i want to continue to add more especially on, on subjects that affect investors we've also we also started doing started doing a radio show in october oh great up in the northwest where we br will bring in wholesalers from different states and we highlight them on a radio show which allows people to see some of the properties that are in the various states and the possibilities because let's face it you know, here in seattle there's nothing cheap about living in Seattle as yeah. far as real estate. But when they see that they can go to like Memphis and buy a you know buy a property in a B A neighborhood for seventy five to a hundred thousand dollars, it's going to make them money. And then when they see what the payment's going to be, they're going, you know, this is great. Yeah, absolutely. I'm with this opportunity. So we're trying to bring that to our client base, and I think that really helps out with our clients that are wholesalers is that people can see what's available out there and, and say, okay, so maybe you can't buy one here in Seattle, 
but maybe I can buy one in Memphis or Indy or Atlanta, wherever I want to buy. Right, right. And if- yeah, there's. It's interesting. I think with uh, there's there's you know more than ever right now. There's a lot of turnkey rental providers. There's a lot of um, kind of franchise uh, property management companies that allow you to own potentially own properties in a bunch of different markets. But from a reporting standpoint, they kind of roll that up, and you can see it. I mean, the time really is right to. Uh, feel comfortable investing in other markets. It's a it's a great time to be investing. Yeah, and and you know, of course, people ask me. They says, you know, when's it going to run out of out of property? And I says, I don't know. I mean, if I had that crystal ball and that, uh, you know, I'd be one rich guy. Yeah. If I had one. What I do know in that is where we saw some reduction in the inventory, where the hedge funds came in and bought real heavily for a couple of years. But we're, we're, we're even seeing that. Where uh, uh, where that's starting to slow down a little bit, they're not buying as much, and even I, I've even got a couple of my wholesalers buying properties from the hedge funds. Right, they're coming back into the market. Yep. So I, I don't necessarily see that shrinking, and I still see it's a great time for people to buy, uh, but they need to look at, you know, maybe they they don't think they can buy. Look at the information because a lot a lot of times people would be surprised that they do have the cash to be able to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, Steve, hey, thanks so much for your time today. We're going to add a link uh, uh, for your website down below so folks that weren't able to write that down can uh, get back and learn more about you. So uh, appreciate your time today. Thank you very much, Mike. All right. Have, have a great day. Take care. All right. Are you a member of Flipner.com, the most robust real estate investing platform in existence, where you can find off-market wholesale deals and great vendors literally in your market? You can get access to advice from experts and learn about local clubs and events right in your backyard. If not, please visit flipner.com and register for a free account. You can register in less than a minute. It's pretty much the coolest site that's ever existed in the real estate investing industry. So get on over to flipner.com.